Ronald E. Crutcher is a relative rarity in higher education, a black man running a very selective and very wealthy predominantly white university. That's not new terrain for him though. As a child living in a predominantly Jewish neighborhood in Cincinnati, and a cellist who navigated the overwhelmingly white world of chamber music, he grew up accustomed to finding his way with people who didn't look or think like he did. Those experiences and his career in higher education helped shape a leadership style focused on bridging divides, which Crutcher, in his last year as president of the University of Richmond, described in his new book, I Had No Idea You Were Black, Navigating Race on the Road to Leadership. I'm Doug Letterman, editor and co-founder of Inside Higher Ed, and Ron Crutcher is my guest in this week's episode of The Key Podcast. I spoke to him last month in the wake of protests at Richmond over whether the university should retain the names of two campus buildings named for men with links to slavery and segregation. In our wide-ranging conversation, he discussed his views on campus race relations, on affirmative action, and on understanding the pain words can cause while still favoring free speech over limiting it. He also discussed his preference, not exactly favored in this moment in our history, for engaging directly with those with whom he disagrees. When you sit down with someone who has a different political persuasion, ideology, that comes from a different race, a different religion, the goal is not necessarily to try to push back at them or to try to change their perspective. The goal is to listen actively so that you come away with a better understanding about why they hold their beliefs. It, you may not, you still, you may not still believe, you know, agree with them, but at least you'll have a deeper understanding. And it's that understanding piece that I think is missing a lot these days. Before welcoming Ron Crutcher to the key, Let's hear from Wiley Education Services, sponsor of this week's episode. Hi, I'm Todd Zipper, president of Wiley Education Services. This episode is brought to you by my new podcast, An Educated Guest. Be sure to check it out. I will be bringing together great minds in higher ed to dive deep into the innovations and trends that will guide the future of education and careers. No small talk, just big ideas. Subscribe and listen on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Ron, welcome to The Key, and thanks for being here. Surely. Thank you for inviting me, Doug. It's good to see you again. You, you as well. So you, you describe the book as being about how you built a, and I'm quoting here, a particular brand of leadership, one focused on bridging divides in race, class, and politics through higher education. Given uh, maybe particularly in this moment that we collectively don't seem to be particularly adept at bridging any of those divides these days, could you describe that leadership style for us? Yeah, well, let me let me describe it first by telling you how I came to uh, take on that that style. I mean, it's really from two, two two influences. One, my father and growing up in. in where I grew up in Cincinnati, we, we very early, when I was three years old, we moved to a predominantly Jewish neighborhood. And my father was criticized a lot by some of his black friends because he was very, he was very engaged in the neighborhood association. He would help out a lot of the women who, a lot of the people who lived around us were widows. And, you know, he would say to us, you know, they're, they're human beings just like we are. I mean, they, they have a different religion. At the bottom of the street was Rockdale Temple. And so, you know, during high holidays, you'd see, you know, throngs of people coming. So that was, that was one influence. But the other was really the fact that very early on in my musical career, I became enamored with chamber music. And this really, I just started thinking about this within the last couple of weeks. In chamber music, the big difference between chamber music and an orchestra is that in chamber music, you have to make decisions collaboratively. And you have to communicate with people, no matter who, who they are. And so very early on at the age of 15, I was playing with folks who were very different, who looked very different from me, who had different perspectives from me, but we had to figure out how to work out playing, performing together. And so those two influences have in, impacted my life so that whenever I interact with people, I always try, as my mother would say, I try to see around any stuff that they have. If it's a, you know, a gruff kind of personality, I don't allow that to impact me. I try to see through to who the real person is. Um, and, uh, and that's sometimes easier, easier said than done. 
But, you know, that's the way I've always comported myself. And so, therefore, I'm just as comfortable sitting down with someone who voted with Donald Trump and having a conversation with them, even though I don't agree and might not agree with them, as I am with sitting down with someone who is of my same race, uh, you know, same political persuasion. And then does that work even if they're not comfortable with you? Well, I was let, let me say, um, and yes, it, it, it works to an extent in the sense that I always, I don't give up on, on people. And so I can, I, I can tell you in my life's experience, there have only been a handful of times when I've totally, you know, given up. And, and, and sometimes it's actually, I mean, I'll tell you, once, once, actually, it's, it, 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 sometimes it's not even people with whom I, I totally disagree from a political perspective. I remember once having a conversation with a German man here in the United States about why I came back to the United States rather than remaining in Germany. It was because I wanted children. I wanted my children to grow up in the, I mean, the United States is an unusual place, right? With all its warts, but it's still, you know, and, and, and as much as I loved Germany, there's something in my heart that said, I'm an American. I really, I want my children to experience that. And so I said, and the, and the mistake I made with him was I said, I came back because I'm a black American. And I, he said, what do you mean? And I said, well, my, my mother's family has had a family reunion for a hundred and over a hundred years. I want my children to experience that because the black American experience is very different from anywhere else in the world. Well, this, that's preposterous. He said, you're more, you're more German than I am. <laughs> and eventually we, I mean, we got into an argument and eventually I said to him, you know what? I think we need just to talk about something else at this point. And, 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 and I have that, I mean, I, I have, you know, I, I have a, a rector that I'm dealing with who's very, very conservative. And, uh, but, but the thing I like about him is he and I can agree to disagree. We'll, you know, we'll just say, we'll agree to disagree. We'll end that topic and then we'll go on to business as usual. So given how that seems not to be <laughs> our general mode of operating these days, or what are the, the yeah. things you do in your own head or, or yeah. the ways you reach out that, yeah. that make that possible? Well, what I would say is, is, is what I would say to you, I would respond this way, the way I, I talk to our students. And I say to them, you know, the, the, when you sit down with someone who has a different political persuasion, ideology that comes from a different race, a different religion, the goal is not necessarily to try to push back at them or to try to change their perspective. The goal is to listen actively so that you come away with a better understanding about why they hold their beliefs. It, you may not, you still, you may not still believe, you know, agree with them, but at least you'll have a deeper understanding. And it's that understanding piece that I think is missing a lot these days. So that, that's a, a good segue to one of the topics I wanted to dig into with you because I'm a not probably won't surprise you. I'm a First Amendment person as a longtime journalist and and a free speech person in general. And I have struggled with watching some of the ways that the free speech debate has unfolded on campuses in in recent years. And you talk in multiple places in the book about your preference for sort of more speech over limiting speech. And a lot of today's young people, don't necessarily share that at least uh, or at least want to take sometimes take steps that don't move in that direction. And I wonder if you understand why a lot of underrepresented students particularly seem to support blocking speech that cause pain. And we know that that some speech can cause pain and fear Mm -hmm. But but there's a sometimes a tendency to want to block it or stop it rather than counter or challenge it. And I'm curious if you have empathy with that point of view and what you say to students when they express that preference. Yeah, and and we we actually have recently had many uh, many um, 
conversations about that issue on our campus because we just developed a free expression statement at the University of Richmond. And so, first of all, yes, I had empathy. I can understand where they're coming from, or try to understand. And then I also say to them, you know, yes, I understand the pain, but I'm an educator. And so as an educator, I cannot allow, I, I think I would be, it would be an abrogation of my duty as an educator at the University of Richmond if I allow you to remain there in that painful place. And so we have a conversation about it. And, and, and actually when I've had, when we had our, our focus groups last fall, when my, when my wife and I have had conversations about these issues and our mentoring group, it's actually other students of color who, who happen to have a different perspective who are helpful in helping their colleagues understand why you can't just easily, it's, it may sound like a good solution to shut it down, but as one, I will never forget, one young woman said the second year we were here, she said, you know, if you draw that line in the sand and you shut someone down because you don't believe, you don't agree with what they say or what they say is hurtful, you know, the next day along, someone could come and shut you down because they disagree with you. So it works both ways. And I mean, I couldn't have put it, more, and, and, and it was, you could see this, oh yeah, okay, that makes a lot of sense. But again, here, I think in, engaging in a conversation and acknowledging, yes, I can understand that it might be painful, you know, but, and, and what, what, I re, what I really don't, what I really get upset about, and I've said this to our faculty, is for those faculty, particularly, I'm going to be, I'm going to just put it out there, particularly our white liberal faculty who will think they are helping students of color by, you know, wrapping their arms around them and, Oh, let me let me shield you. That's not helping them in the long run. Run in the real world, quite frankly. I think what I've said cons consistently: we need to help them first. You know, empathize with them, help them, then to look inside of themselves and to muster up the strength to either do counter speech, to demonstrate, go online, whatever. Right. That that point you made that uh, you, that student made. A lot of that would be revealed through a probably a better study of history. Because yeah. uh, when you no, and I, and I and I I've had people ex yeah. tell me that they think part of the reason we're in the situation we're in is because we've seen such an erosion of civics education and yeah. in, yeah. in uh, before higher education. But you know, if you study the 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 history closely, you see who free speech was designed to. Yeah to support to uh, and, and protect to a well, large what about, extent. What about the civil rights movement? Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, it, were it not for free speech, free speech that movement would not have thrived and been successful. I so mean, I'm, yeah. So I'm speaking with Ron Crutcher, president of the University of Richmond and author of the book, I had no idea you were black. And I wanna shift a little bit toward uh, some topics related to race, because it's obviously one of the areas that you have focused on uh, in your leadership style. And I'm interested in how you view the the role of institutions like Richmond. You've been you've worked at a wide range of institutions, from major re public research universities uh, to small private ones, and and we're in a moment where deep deep concern about underrepresented students of all kinds. We've seen them suffer much much of the brunt of the pandemic and the recession in terms of enrollment. We've seen a uh, disproportionate impact on uh, students of color. And we had been seeing pre-pandemic some, I would say, modest progress in, in, uh, in getting more underrepresented students into higher education, in part through real pressure on institutions uh, for perhaps collectively for sort of not fulfilling entirely higher education's perceived role as a, as a gateway to the middle class. And, I, and I'm curious, I know you have worked hard at Richmond to uh, change its, and I know some work had been done before you got there and Ed Ayers uh, set, set you up uh, right. fairly well, but I'm curious about, again, the role of, of a, pretty selective liberal arts college in uh, being a force for post-secondary access as opposed to 
and again, there, there shouldn't be, it shouldn't be oppositional, but, but uh, alongside the major public four-year universities, community colleges that educate disadvantaged students in much greater numbers. And I'm curious how, what you think of their sort of relative roles of those different institutions yeah. in f- serving this greater goal. Well, first you should know that at least in the state of Virginia, the private institutions in Virginia educate a higher percentage of mm. low-income students and students of color than the, private, than the public institutions, ironically, ironically. Um, and that's one of the points of pride that we make in the CICB, the Council on Independent Colleges in, uh, in, in Virginia. But what I would say, it's a critically important, well, it's a good question, Doug. And, and as you alluded to, you know, I, before I came to the University of Richmond, Ed Ayers, had already challenged our board back in 2007 when he went here. You know, he, he basically said, there's no reason why with our huge endowment, we shouldn't be educating a higher percentage of low income students. At that time, 9% Pell Grant eligible is where we were. Now we're at about 17% now. At that time, 11% students of color were about 30% now. And, and in, in my inaugural address, however, I shifted the focus and I said, it's great that we have now, at that point, we had maybe 16% Pell Grant eligible, 23, 24% students of color. It's great that you've improved that, but, but now we have to work on ensuring that those low-income students, so students of color, those first-generation students feel as though they belong here, feel included, and, and, and can thrive here. That's been our primary, and, and one of the reasons why we're at this debacle where we're experiencing right now. The good sign is that wouldn't have happened 10 years ago. (laughs) This is a good thing on our, as we are, you know, we're, as we're evolving toward a truly inclusive institution. So absolutely we have a, we, we, you know, it's incumbent upon us to, to ensure that all students who want to study at the University of Richmond have access. We're one of the few schools that's need blind and we provide 100% of demonstrated need. And I will say, I just saw the, the, the information this morning. I mean, I'm pleased that despite all the craziness that's been going on, on our campus, the deposits from black students this year are way, way up from last year. So, you know, but, but, but again, simply getting a degree is not enough, right? Uh, what what we need to ensure is that while the students are getting the degree, they are thriving, they are participating fully in everything the school has to offer. And by the way, once they get their degree, that we're helping them on uh, at, at the same level as we are the majority of students to get a position or go on to graduate school. And and what has been the pr- what have been the primary elements of that shift from? diversity slash access to yeah. inclusion and ultimate sort of success yeah. at the institution? What have been the focus areas and, and what has worked best from your perspective? Well, I mean, I would, I would say what is working best? It's a work in progress. Sure. Because if, if there's one thing I would have changed in my inaugural address when I made this challenge to the community, I would have said, I would have emphasized that you know this kind of transformation doesn't won't happen in five or ten years. It takes a long while. But what has worked best for us, I think, is that we've taken we developed a plan called Making Excellence Inclusive, and in and in, and in, in carrying out that plan, rather than hiring a chief diversity officer, we appointed a, a woman who was already at the university working in uh, civic engagement as a she's a, a, a senior administrative officer for equity and community. She sits on the president's cabinet and then she works with, um, with, with a, 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 a council that's, served, that's made up of individuals who have been working in these areas of equity, inclusion, diversity. Um, they, they have a coach, two co-chairs, a faculty and the staff co-chair, and their goal is to serve as consultants, if you will. Um, and then, uh, you know, we're, we're, we, we work together. We have a cabinet, two, our two executive vice presidents, the president, the two co-chairs of the of this uh, coordinating council and um, and the senior administrative officer. 
And that has worked really, really well for us, uh, particularly in situations like we're experiencing right now, because we've been doing this for almost two years. So we have a working relationship and we can be brutally honest with each other. We do uh, uh, regular surveys of college presidents and one of the more stunning findings each year, and it changed a little bit this year, is that presidents tend to think racial relations on campus nationally are a mess, but they're pretty pretty good on their own campuses. And, and that's always a little disturbing. That gap actually narrowed some this year uh, with some mo- slightly more acknowledgement that things were not good or excellent on their own campuses, but still roughly two thirds of presidents saying so. And I'm curious, do you what would be your explanations for why campus leaders might think things are are good or excellent on their campus? Is it just uh, a form of blindness? Is it that things are actually better than than those of us not on the campuses might think? Are they using the wrong or misguided way, metrics for judging that? What's your sense of, of when you talk to your peers and... Yeah. Uh, I, I would say, I mean, it's it's this sense of you know, you know, they really don't know. They they, they really don't know unless you are interacting with students of color, low income students on a regular basis, which is what my wife and I do. I mean, we have a we have a mixed group. We don't have only students of color and low income or first generation students in our mentoring group, but we talk about these issues with them, and so you know. Uh, what we're experiencing now at the University of Richmond with the naming is something which I kn- knew we were eventually going to experience. And, and what I said to the student activists is, what took you so long? I've been waiting for you for five years, six years. Um, but if you're not, if, you, if you're not, uh, if you're only talking to kind of the student leaders, you're not getting a real, you're not always getting uh, an accurate assessment of what the real lived experience is like. And that's what, so that's what I attribute it to, quite frankly. Yeah, and, and that's one of my theories is that it's only when something bursts into visibility that presidents may think something's wrong. Right. And you know the situation you've had recently, and obviously we've seen that unfold on a lot of campuses, but I suppose if, if you're on one of those campuses and where you haven't had a an incident or an explosion of some kind, yeah, yeah. Uh, you might be able to say, "Oh, things are things are okay here." Yeah, no, but but this is the way I describe it, and, I, and when I've talked, and my, my president's cabinet members will tell you this. I've been talking about this since actually fall of 2015, after the Missouri situation happened, and we had a silent protest on our campus. Now it wasn't a protest; it was a uh, in solidarity with them. A hundred so students carry signs. I was fully expecting them at my office. Nobody came to my office. They were very respectful. But I said to my colleagues, you know, you know, we, we you know, we, we dodged the bullet, but it's simmering below the surface. I, 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 I'm even, and that was my first semester here. And even just with the few people, students of color I talked to there, I, I knew it was there. You know, they were tolerating. Uh, and so eventually what we experienced this, this spring was going to come. And as I said before, it's a good sign. I mean, it's a, it's, it, mean, it means we're on our way to becoming eventually becoming that, that truly inclusive community that we aspire to be. Uh, but there are going to be some bumps along the way. Mm-hmm. And, um, and that uncomfortable as it may be, you see that as a, a necessary step. No, absolutely unnecessary. Yeah. Because for one thing, when I met with our student activists, I, I, I actually thank them because they have raised the consciousness of our faculty. Now, you know, I don't even know. If I'm going to say it anyway. <laughs> down. Faculty, you know, have very short memories. So suddenly, you know, the consciousness has been raised. But I, what I want to say to them is, where were you five years ago when I had students telling me about X, Y, and Z experience in your classroom? The trustees don't teach classes. It's our faculty who teach classes. So I am pleased that they now are so concerned that hopefully there will be some 
behavioral changes in the classroom. And little, little, I mean, I'm talking about little things that people don't think about. When you have one student of color in your classroom, and suddenly when the monument issue comes up, and everyone else around the student is talking about, well, you can't take the monuments down. You know, that's you're 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 you're, you're trying to get rid of history. And and the and and what the professor could have done is simply said, well, you know, there are some people who think X, Y, and Z. Not saying that they think that, but this student sat there and, and had to listen to this, and of course didn't express her opinion because she was. This was four years ago, you know, on our campus, uh, and and so uh, so I'm 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 pleased that the faculty now uh, have have their consciousness and has has been raised, and hopefully we'll see some change. I, I will say at the University of Richmond, uh, four years ago, three years ago. We had an opportunity to host a uh, an inclusive pedagogy institute for the uh, Associated Colleges of the South. We were allowed to bring, you know, I think, I think it was 25, 50 of our faculty signed up for it. So they ended up doing two different workshops. And then later that academic year, at the end of the academic year, our own faculty and a group of our faculty had, had uh, organized a learning community on inclusive pedagogy. Our own faculty then organized um, a workshop internally, and we had 103 faculty who participated. So our fa our faculty is in, you know is interested in learning how to facilitate difficult conversations because that's part of what they're learning, particularly around race and some of the and 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 and, and around po politics as well. But they're also learning how to make all students feel more welcome in their classrooms how not to make assumptions about a student, a guy who looks like a football player, and you assume they're a football player and on scholarship and, 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 and they're one of our Richmond scholars, you know, that kind of thing. Um, the, the book includes a line uh, that's in there kind of on its own. Uh, it was in a larger section, but it jumped out at me a little bit. It said, despite its original intent and one-time necessity, affirmative action has not served black and brown people well. Does that lead you to think that it's time is past, even though we continue to have significant attainment gaps and, and structural racism? Yeah. Uh, and, and what are potentially effective alternatives to it uh, that don't carry some of the same negatives? So what, what I, I included that purposely I, I had because I had had a conversation with my editor about my feelings about affirmative action. What I mean by that is that I do think it was necessary at one point in time. But unfortunately, the unintended consequences was that it branded black people in a way, in a way that, that I think was unfair, quite frankly, but nonetheless, that was the outcome. And so the, uh, what, I would, what I prefer is just doing, you know, kind of target of opportunity searches where you're looking for, you know, you, you, don't, you don't necessarily say you're looking for a person of color, but there are ways that you can, you can craft a position, let's say, in a political science uh, position, where you you know you have as one of the the areas of, of research, uh, you know, black politics or something, you know, and 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 not everybody who studies black politics is a person of color necessarily, but you're more likely to get someone who uh, is a person of color who who has that 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 background. I think also cluster hires. So now that's another way where you build in, you fold into that um, a cluster hire, we're doing a cluster hire right now in Africana Studies. All of the, the, the candidates for those, and what, cluster, what I mean by cluster hires, you open it up and you say, we're gonna have three positions, any rank, any rank, three positions, but the, the, the person, and it can be in any department, as long as you understand that part of that person's job is going to be to teach courses that will be part of the Africana Studies program. That gives you lots of opportunity there if you do the searches right. I mean, the big issue, Doug, is that many people d don't really know how to how to do searches that are truly inclusive. And and what that means is what I mean by that is that you don't just simply put out an NA, right? You have to be proactive. You have to go after people. You have to call your colleagues at, at other universities. Do you have a woman or a person of color in your cohort of PhD students who's promising? 
you know, and we we have this position. Would she like to be? <laughs> it's harder. It's harder. It's much harder. I mean, a lot more affirmative, time. Action, affirmative action can be a a, sh a shortcut or a, a yeah. crux yeah. almost, a and it has those downsides. So, so again, so just to clarify, you're almost talking. You're talking more from a practice than a policy standpoint. Exactly. Precisely. Yeah. 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 Makes yeah. sense. To sum up. How do you feel about the state of higher education as you prepare to retire from academic leadership next year? We're, we're, at, a, we're at a difficult place right now in higher education uh, because I think what, what we see, you know, I, I think we see on, uh, uh, replicated on our campuses what or, or played out on our campuses, you know, the, the impact of what's happening in our in our country right now. I mean, our country is incredibly polarized. I mean, I don't need to tell you that. You know, look at the last election. Incredibly, and not only are we polarized, but people in the various bubbles only interact with people in those bubbles. And, and worse than that, they, they vilified people in, in, the, in the other bubbles. And so, uh, but I see that as a tremendous opportunity for us in higher education, a tremendous opportunity to do what I think uh, was one of the one of the things we were called on to do. We have been called on to do, and that is to educate our future citizens to be to 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 be a, effective and uh, engaging participants in the democratic uh, in the democratic society. Now, think about this, and I mentioned this in, in the in the, the book. When I saw these statistics, it really it really kind of took me aback. Most Americans live in segregated communities. 91% uh, of whites have only other whites as part of their, their internal you know, network. 84% of blacks, 63, 64% of Hispanics. So what that says to me as a university leader is that when our students come to us, particularly in residential institutions, they don't really have an experiential base from which to develop relationships across political divides, racial divides, class divides, religious, religious divides. So we have to help them with that. I think that's one of our duties. And, and what I've said at the University of Richmond and everything we're trying to do is I wanna ensure when our graduates leave here that they're comfortable in any kind of environment that you could you know, hypothetically or metaphorically drop them anywhere in the world and you know they would be able to develop a life they'd be able to thrive they wouldn't recoil because of the voices they heard the smells the food whatever now that's you know that's really kind of <laughs> way out there necessarily but i think that's the role that we have to play and we, and, and, and to, to put it more kind of uh, in a, in, a in, in more drastic terms we have a role to play in helping to ensure the survival of our democratic society in the United States of America, which is not doing so well right now. I've heard, I've heard. <laughs> yeah. But so, but, but actually, so, and maybe this is a way to tie it back to sort of your, your approach to leadership and communication, but it sounds, you can't just put a group of people together necessarily no. and expect them to figure it out. Um, so I don't know what the, you know, if you can draw that chamber music analogy or something yeah. else, but so yeah. you, you, you put a group of people together from different perspectives, different backgrounds, et cetera. What, what are the key things to, oh, I, to, no, to have them I, I've thought a lot about that. And I have been pushing this since I came to the university of Richmond. And that is, I am a real, and I, I mentioned this in the book, I'm a, I'm a real proponent of using the University of Michigan practice of intergroup dialogue. It's very, well, it's not simple uh, because, it's, because it requires, in order for it to work, you have to have trained facilitators. But, but what, is, what is really great about it is it, it helps people learn how to do what I talked about earlier, this active listening. And you start out, with really simple stuff, like just talking about your background, right? Where you came from, where you grew up, describe the street you grew up on. And, and, but people are taught how to listen carefully 
and they're and then and, and then once they learn they 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 are comfortable with that they learn so much more about the about the co- their colleagues around them at a personal level because I truly believe that we are never going in this country we're never really going to resolve the issues we have around systemic racism our uh, lack of really dealing with the vestiges of segregation uh, slavery etc until we combine the head with the heart it's not a head thing it's not simply learning the history it's understanding what that the impact that history has had on people black and brown people even today so so what we've done at the university of richmond finally we have what was called a community dialogue network they went to the university of michigan intergroup dialogue institute they are they 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 are trained facilitators they are training internal facilitators uh, to do the, the, these groups and um, um, and eventually in the freshman class there will be ways to inter, inter, integrate this this intergroup dialogue actually i will say our students already have started this they have a program called interpoint which was started by two students hmm. one of my wife's mentees started it and it's just it's it, it's amazing and and let me just end by giving you this one example of the impact so as you know you know that we had this naming this, na- this naming issue on the campus this spring and at one point i was meeting with my first year uh, mentees shortly after everything kind of blew up and so I said, okay, tell me what you think about what's going on. Well, the first person was a biracial student who said, well, you know, I, I signed the petition. I agree that the name should come down. And, um, and then another student said, well, you know, I'm not really sure. Uh, I, 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 you know, I, I'm more interested in the lived experience. And so we went on for 45 minutes having this really intense conversation where I, where I, I learned that they hadn't really read the documents. They really didn't know the histories. So, you know, I had to, I, I, I went through and gave them the history of Freeman and, and Ryland. And at the end of the discussion, uh, we always do a summary, you know, how, how was this for you today? The student who started out, the biracial student, he said, you know, you know, uh, Dr. Crutcher, if every American citizen could have that kind of discussion that we had today, at least once each week, this country wouldn't be so polarized. Mm. And I thought, I said to him, may I quote you on that? <laughs> but now, you know, it's not, obviously it's not as easy as that, right? If that were easy as that, then I, I, I could become a gazillionaire. Exactly. <laughs> and, and I mean, I mean that those segregation stats that you laid out make it, you know, uh, pretty difficult to picture how yeah. you bring that about yeah. in, in yeah. places that are not, where people haven't chosen to come, yes. but it's a, but you, yeah. but, you, but 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 that's where you start at least. Yeah, our yeah. church. We go to a predominantly white Episcopalian church. Right. We're do, going through this right now in our church, for the, because yeah. of you know everything that's going on around us, and um, uh, and so you know you, you go step by step. That's all you can do. Yeah. You know you can't do it. You know what do they call them? Those lobotomies. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That was Ron Crutcher, president of the University of Richmond and author of I Had No Idea You Were Black. Thanks to Ron for joining us and to Wiley Education for its sponsorship of the last three episodes of The Key. We appreciate its support. Thanks, too, to all of you for taking the time to listen. I hope some of you are enjoying a bit of downtime as we all navigate our slow returns to a new kind of post-pandemic life. I feel like we're all kind of wading into a cold ocean at slightly different paces and with slightly different degrees of comfort and anxiety. Whether you're only up to your knees or just about to hit that particularly sensitive spot in your midsection, or whether you dove in head first and think everybody should be in the deep water with you, please try to be patient and understanding with those around you. We showed each other a lot of respect and kindness during the pandemic, and I'm hoping we can all hold on to at least some of that as we resume a more normal life. Until next week, I'm Doug Letterman, and this is The Key. Stay well and stay safe.